Happy Sabbath to everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to come to God's house to listen to his word. I'm very delighted to see those of you who've come. May I see the hands of those who are visiting with us for the first time? May I see your hands, please. Would you stand up? First time, stand up. Oh, can we all say amen? amen? We're delighted you've come and may God bless you. You may be seated. Now, I want another group to stand. If you are visiting and you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'd like you to stand. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist, I'd like you to stand. All right, God bless you, Brother William, nice to see you. God bless you, my sister, God bless you. Way back there, God bless you. Wherever you are, we're delighted you've come to be with us. And may the good God of heaven and earth bless you with a message from his word. God is good. And all the time. Yes, Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. So God is good, and we're grateful to him for that. Tonight is the final night, as you've been told, in the revival series. Our subject is numb and dumb. What did I say? Numb and dumb. Before I begin, please, if you have a cell phone, would you kindly turn it off? I did not even bring mine. If you have a cell phone, we're asking you politely, turn it off completely, as you do in a courtroom. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I would like you to pray for me. And what I'd like you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That request is a very serious request. For those of you who've come night after night, how many of you have prayed for me while I was speaking? May I see your hands? Thank you. I'm expecting more hands, but I'll take what I've gotten. The rest of you, please take tonight to pray and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, what's that? Think. Let's think. Use the faculties that God has so generously given to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Draw close to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Without his aid, we cannot understand your word and will misinterpret it. Hence, O oh Lord, for the sake of truth, for the sake of your glory, grant us your spirit, Father that he may lead us into truth. And as for me, let him take possession of my mind and speak through me. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Numb and dumb. The book of Malachi has a series of very interesting questions. And in a certain sense, all the questions are related and so are the responses. The first question is found, or the first statement followed by a question. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. In that passage, God speaks first. And God said, I have loved thee, saith the Lord. He is telling his people, I have loved you, I have loved thee. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? We don't see how you love us. Is it possible that God's people cannot and do not see the evidences of his love? Is it possible that we are so hardened in sin that we do not sense, we do not feel the evidences of God's tender love. And so God said, I have loved thee, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? We don't see it. Chapter 2 of Malachi, verse 17. Another statement. Ye have wearied the Lord, 
with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? God makes a complaint. You've been speaking some very unkind words against me. And God's people say, when? We have no concept. We have no awareness. We have no idea. We have spoken harshly against you. We are not sensitive to that. Chapter 3, verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you. But ye said, wherein shall we return? God is saying, come back to me. And they're saying, how? We have no idea how to come back. Look at verse 8 of Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? This is amazing. God is saying, you have stolen from me. And they say, how? We're not aware of taking anything from you fraudulently. Verse 13 of Malachi 3. God again issues a complaint. Your words have been very stout against me, saith the Lord. The word stout means strong and rough and harsh. Your words have been very stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein have we spoken so much against thee? We have no idea. My brothers and sisters, is it possible that God sees us one way and we see ourselves an entirely different way? Is it possible that we are numb to our true condition? In Conflict and Courage, Page 22, paragraph 3, Ellen White makes a very alarming statement. Well, not alarming, amazing. Here's what she says. As Adam witnessed the first signs of decay in the falling leaf and in the drooping flowers, he mourned more deeply than men now mourn over the dead. Let me modernize that. It doesn't need it, but let me do it. What she's saying, when Adam saw the first leaf fall, when he saw the first flower droop its head in preparation for death, he cried the way we cry at funerals today. I'm from the state of Michigan. And every fall, people come from all over the country, perhaps from all over the world, to see a sight. They pay thousands of dollars to see it. And none of them cries. They bring cameras and they take pictures. You know what they come to see? The changing of the colors of the leaves. And as the leaves begin to change color... Of course, the, the tree is preparing to shut down, and so the leaves are preparing to fall. That's why the color changes, and then they fall. So leaves are strewn all over the place where the tours are taken to view the various colors. They are paying money, and people are rejoicing. Oh my, look at the leaves. They are rejoicing at a sight that drove Adam to tears. Something has changed between Adam's day and our day that what made him cry as if he were at a funeral makes us rejoice. We have become numb with the passing of the years. 1994 there was a horrendous genocide in the country of Rwanda. The experts estimate approximately 800,000 people were killed within a four to five month span. By a show of hands, how many of us cried? 
We have two hands. Three. Four. How many people are present? 700. In 2000, and was it four? The tsunami hit the Indian Ocean Rim. Nearly 300,000 people died. Many of you are from the Philippines, Indonesia. By a show of hands, how many of us cried? Can I see your hands? Cried. You have about a dozen hands. September 11, 2001, two planes crashed into the World Trade Towers. About 3,000 people died. How many cried? A few more hands. Let me not prolong this. What am I trying to say? If what leaves us unfazed today had happened in Adam's day, Adam would have fainted. We are suffering from a case of spiritual numbness. In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, Ezekiel has this vision of God coming to execute judgment on Jerusalem. And there's an angel that has an ink horn and he's about to go through the city. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 9 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that do what? Sigh. And what? Cry for what? All the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. God's seal will be placed on those who suffer as a result of sin. Not, I don't mean suffer because they sin, but they suffer because there is sin. Most Christians are not fazed at all by the fact that there is sin in this world. We go about our business, we're busy, we're absorbed, pursuing a career, securing ourselves in this life, whatever it is that occupies our time, and we do not have a deep reaction to something that brought suffering to heaven. Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry, my brothers and sisters, if we are not broken hearted over sin, something is wrong. There's no difference how many offices you hold in the church and how many generations you go back who are Adventists or Baptists or whatever you may be. There is a global numbness among so-called believers that leaves them unaffected by sin. We sometimes think of Lot as a shaky character, but the Bible describes Lot as righteous and just, the well, same thing. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says that God delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the righteous. Verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Bible said that Lot suffered. He was hurt. He was bothered by sin. He was not numb. But the tragedy is, it is not that there's a general numbness towards sin. There's a numbness towards sin in the church. Church discipline is fast disappearing. You can do whatever you like, and there's no discipline. People have this strange argument. If you discipline members, you're not loving. Are you listening to me? 
in the church, there seems to be a callous mess regarding sin. And I hesitate to give examples. I don't want to embarrass anyone. But you can do a number of things in the church and not be disfellowshipped. And I mean, you pick any of the Ten Commandments. You can break them and no action is taken because people tend to see nothing wrong. Or if they see something wrong, it is just small. What's the big deal? I was talking to a friend of mine in another country. And... Um, How should I say this? This thing goes all over the world. <laughs> she had a child with a man who was not of the church. And um, I was talking to her, but I saw her afterwards. And she said, church members are encouraging her to marry the man. And their reasoning is, he's the father. You might as well marry him. Now, the Adventist church has a standing policy. Adventists must not marry non-Adventists. But for convenience sake, this young lady is advised by members. You have his child, you might as well marry him. So try to make a right by adding one wrong to another. There is a numbness. Another young lady spoke to me in another country, which will remain unnamed, and she was distressed. You know how the older sisters like to press the young ladies, get married, get married. And the pressure leads some to make catastrophic decisions. Well, in other parts of the world, it's not just get married. The pressure is also have a child, have a child, have a child. So this lady came up to this young lady and said, you're 27, 28, you have no children. What's the problem? She said, well, I don't have a husband. The member told her, why don't you have a child with one of the elders? Because married men are safe. And she was so distressed. How could a member of the church, a woman whose husband is an elder, give that kind of catastrophic, soul-destroying advice? Because there is a numbness in the church to sin. A young lady wrote me an email. I'm under pressure to work on Sabbath. I wrote back, in very direct language, don't do it. Don't even discuss it. And so for weeks, she had this struggle, job, the employees were, employers were trying to pressure her, don't work. They threatened to fire her, I said, don't work. It's not really I'm saying that, God is saying that, don't work. So she called her parents, who were long-standing Adventists. Mom, Dad, I'm under pressure. They want me to work on Sabbath. <laughs> you can guess what the parents said. What do you think they said? Work. You're young. You have to establish yourself. You need a home. You need this. Work. There is a numbness in the church. A couple of refugees from another country migrated to the United States. They're living in Minnesota somewhere. And they wrote me because I had been in contact with them from the previous country. They said, we're here. We don't, have, we don't have work yet, but we're living with some friends. I believe the friends are Adventists. They said, we keep getting job offers, but the offers require work on Sabbath, and we won't do it. And our friends with whom we're staying are about to put us out because they are saying we are wasting good opportunities. 
there is a numbness towards sin in the church. Is there a way to deal with this numbness? I ask you again, is there a biblical way to reverse the numbness and to develop sensitivity to sin and to righteousness? The answer is yes. But this way, which is clear in the Bible, for so many of us, we are dumb to this way. And as long as we remain dumb, we remain numb. Go with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, we shall begin reading at verse 7. Does the Bible provide a way to remove this numbness that's pervading the churches? So that sin just washes off our back like water off the back of a duck. Is there a biblical way to reverse this condition? Romans 7, reading from verse 7, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The initial clue from this verse is that God's instrument, and we'll continue reading, God's instrument for removing numbness and sensitizing his people is his law. As I've told you, my purpose this week has been to magnify God's law and make it honorable as I connect it to Jesus Christ and the gospel. God has provided a way to sensitize his people. And so Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Let me tell you something about sin and the problem some of us have with sin. Someone may say, well, I'm not numb to sin. I recognize sin. It is not enough to recognize sin. You have to recognize the sinfulness of sin. You didn't get it? Sin, by Satan's arrangement, does not appear sinful. Now, we see this all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. Now he's, con he's contradicting God's word. Now he knows he has to present it in a way that's attractive. And so he says in verse 5 of Genesis 3, For God doth know. That in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When he said that, when he preside, pr 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 presented the presumed bright side of disobedience, the Bible says in verse 6 of Genesis 3, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, which it was not, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, which it was not calculated to do. But she saw the tree as harmless. She saw a forbidden thing as beneficial. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We have to understand. We must recognize sin, yes. But we must recognize the sinfulness of sin. 
And it is only when we recognize the sinfulness, the horror of sin, that we recoil and we seek the Savior. Because the wickedness and the horror of sin is found in us. The Bible says in Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We do not see the desperate wickedness in our hearts. And the verse goes on to say, who can know it? You know what that means? Without help from God through his law, you and I will never have a sense of how truly wicked we are and can be. Is there a cure for the spiritual numbness? The answer is yes, and it is God's law. We continue in Romans chapter 7. Let's go to verse 8. But sin, Romans 7 verse 8. But sin, uh, Paul says, which wrought in him all manner of concupiscence, taking occasion by the commandment. What does it mean by that? Paul, up to this point, Paul is saying, there was a time when I lived, I was not aware how sinful I was. Just not aware. A man came home one night, he was terribly hungry. Came home so late, the wife was sleeping. Left the food on the table. So he turned on the kitchen light, saw the food there, and covered with ants. He turned off the light and started to eat. <laughs> Couldn't see the ants. Are you with me? Now, the law is God's light that reveals the ants in our lives. Now, without that light, Paul said, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. First 9 of, of Romans chapter 7. He said, I was alive without the law once. What he means by alive, he was fine with the life he was living. But when the commandment came, when a knowledge of God's law came to Paul, he realized... How wicked he was. He realized how sinful he was. That's what he means by sin revived. And he said, I died. What does he mean by I died? He began to feel the weight of guilt. He began to see how horrible and what a terrible person he was. And all his sense of self-sufficiency, all his pride in who he was, that collapsed. That's how he died. And by the way, until you experience that, you cannot experience conversion. What did that for Paul? The law of God. Verse 10. And that which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. And I told you earlier in the week, the law was given for life. But to the sinner, it condemns. It represents death. And so Paul said, this thing which was ordained to life. For the converted person, God's law is life. It's a life preserver. But for the sinner, it's death and condemnation. And Paul said, that which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Let's skip to verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Referring to the law. Is the law truly, originally, an instrument of death? The answer is no. God forbid. God did not give the law as a means of death. The law is a, is a preserver of life. And so Paul says, God forbid. But sin, that it might do what? Appear sin. Work in death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become what? Exceeding sinful. You take away God's commandments. And the sinfulness of sin vanishes. And all sin becomes is a minor irritation, an indiscretion, a bad choice. It is not something horrible. Let me repeat. Take away God's law, and the world remains numb. 
to its true condition. The law of God is an instrument that convicts. It's an instrument that slays the sinner. It slays the sinner in the sense that the sinner gets a proper uh, estimate of his or her true condition. And when the person sees his or her true condition, the person dies. In the sense that the person realizes, I need someone to deliver me. Why Paul cried out, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the answer always is Christ. There are people in churches every weekend, Adventist churches, Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, who are numb to their true condition. They are church members making the lives of other church members a living hell. And see no problem. There are church members who come to church dressed anyway. And see no problem. There are church members who do anything they like on Sabbath. And they see no problem. And so the anthem of the church has become, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? No one can see what's wrong with anything because even for the church that presumably respects God's law, God's law has been relegated. And so we are in a condition where no one sees anything. We are numb and we are dumb. But the Bible has a cure. And it is that about which I have spoken all week. The law of God. Which expresses his righteousness and his holiness. We tend to think righteousness and holiness are two different things. We see righteousness as doing what's right. We see holiness of being free from impurities, free from stains. And we think holiness is different from righteousness. A holy person is a little higher than a righteous person. There is no difference between righteousness and holiness. A holy person is someone who has had a proper understanding of his or her wickedness and has gone to Jesus Christ for cleansing, for restoration, and through his continual grace has grown and grown and grown, separating himself or herself more and more from the world and its impurities. The only way to be pure in the sight of God is to live a life in harmony with the same law that approved the life of Jesus Christ. When people who make no profession of Christ engage in sin, it's horrible in the sight of God. But when those of us who profess a relationship with Christ see nothing wrong with sin, then it becomes an abomination in the sight of God. The Bible speaks of sins and it speaks of abominations. Now, any sin will get you lost if it remains unconfessed in your life. But some sins are truly horrible. They are abominations and one of them must be the fact that so-called Christians do not see sin for what it is. If you don't see sin for what it is, How can you prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ? If I don't see sin for what it is, how can I grow in grace when I approve that which works contrary to grace? God has given to us his law. The law has several functions. One of them is to reveal to the sinner the true extent of the sinner's condition. It is when that happens that the sinner, seeing the hopelessness of his condition, turns to Jesus Christ. But the church is full from top to bottom with Christians who really feel no need for Christ. Let me say it again. The church is full of people 
who feel no need for Jesus Christ. They are loyal to the church as an organization. They support the church financially. They defend the church, but they feel no need for Christ because they have no sense of their sinfulness. And if some of us would catch a glimpse of our true condition, we would seek reconversion and rebaptism. Numb and dumb. Ellen White writes, Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. The Lord calls for a decided reformation. And when a man is truly reconverted, or a woman, let him be rebaptized. Let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. Reconversion must take place among the members. That as God's witnesses, they may testify to the authoritative power of the truth that sanctifies the soul. Some of us need to start with God all over again. I mean, start all over again. When David sinned, he had to start all over again. Ellen White writes, he confessed, he repented, and he was reconverted. That's David, on whose throne Christ will sit. He confessed, he repented, he was reconverted. David needed reconversion. The man of whom God said, he was a man after my own heart. Because David, after he sinned, a double barrel sin, adultery and murder, it only struck him when Nathan the prophet came to him and brought it to his attention. David apparently was suffering from a degree of numbness. David. If that can afflict David, the sweet singer of Israel, the writer of the Psalms, can it afflict us? Yes. My brothers, my sisters, as you sit where you sit and you listen to God's word, may I ask you a question? Do not answer me. Are you numb spiritually? Does sin bother you? Not only in your life, but in others. I've heard Christians say, I don't do this or that, but if you want to do it, that's fine. You may have heard that. I don't do it, but if you want to do it, that's fine. No child of God should speak like that. It is not fine for anyone to say, not for me or for you. If I do it, it's not fine. If you do it, it is not fine. We must have a hatred for sin. And that hatred can only grow as we glimpse the righteousness of Christ in the law. And so God the Father himself said of Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness, which is right doing, and hated iniquity. Let me ask you a question. Do we hate sin? Question two, don't answer me, or three. There is a sin you and I are committing. Are we bothered? Are we bothered? Are we troubled? Do we lose sleep at night? Now, if you're threatened with dismissal from the job, you lose sleep. If you heard that your son was in prison, you would lose sleep. Do we lose sleep over the sins in our lives? And I know I seem to be beating the thing over and over, but I must. Jesus told Peter, lovest thou me? Yes. Lovest thou me? Yes. Lovest thou me? Until he thought Peter got it. Tonight... Someone needs to make a decision to start with God 
all over again. Not because you're so satanic, but because you perhaps have realized, having come all this week, I have been on a routine with God. It has been the force of habit. My Christian life has been flatlining for years. It has not been like this. And by the way, in a Christian life, you either go this way or that way. You can't flatline. Someone needs to decide. I need to start all over with God. I need a sensitivity to sin. As Jesus had. Job. God described Job as righteous, perfect, upright, one who avoided or eschewed evil. But in Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6, Job said, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, and I repent, I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. When Job got a clearer glimpse of God's righteousness, then he saw himself, he repented. That's a man described as perfect. The greatest form of deception is self-deception. And this is the problem of the Laodicean church. The last message of seven that Jesus sent to the seven churches. I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Why? Because in verse 17 it said, we are rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And God says, I see it the opposite. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Numb. Cannot feel what God sees we need. Let me say it again. This is God's message to the end time church. That's who we are. God sees we have tremendous needs. We see nothing. We look around. I'm fine. I'm rich. Increase with goods. How does it end? Have need of nothing. God says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. We are numb to God's assessment of us. And God says, I counsel you. I plead with you, buy of me gold. What's the currency you use to buy something from God? The currency is sin. Give him the sin. And he gives us his righteousness. Let me say it again. Give God the sin. That's the currency. And he gives you something in return, his righteousness. I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire. That's faith. And faith is based on the word of God. And a white raiment, the righteousness of Jesus Christ as expressed in the law and in the life of Christ. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, the Spirit of God, that we may see our condition. Somebody needs to say, Lord, I want to start my walk with you. All over again. Who will make that decision? Start. Very serious call. I want to start all over again. If you raise your hand, stand up quickly but quietly. I want to start, listen to me carefully, all over again. This is not recommit the life. That's different. I am saying, start with God all over again. Second call. Eloi says, when a man is truly reconverted, let him be rebaptized. Or maybe baptized for the first time. Someone wants to say, as a result of this week, I need to make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized. 
If you want to make that decision tonight, I think you should. Baptized or rebaptized? Raise your right hand. Come. Come, Brother William, come. Don't be afraid. Come, my brother, come. Come, my brother. If you raise your hand, come. I want to be baptized or rebaptized. I want an elder of the church to come and stand with Brother William, some leader of the church, so he's not alone. Thank you, Dr. Baroy. I want to be baptized or rebaptized. Raise your hands. And come. I want to be baptized, rebaptized, and I'm willing to make that decision tonight. Come. Don't be afraid. If the Spirit of God is touching your heart, make the decision tonight. I have been reconverted during this week. I need to be rebaptized. Or oh, I need to make the decision for the first time to be baptized. I know enough. I can't wait until I know everything. That will never happen. I need to make the decision to be baptized or rebaptized. Come. Someone else come. Don't be afraid. Just come. I need to be baptized, rebaptized. Just come. Don't be afraid. If you're afraid, let the person next to you walk with you. I won't delay you long, but I need to give you time to make that decision. Someone else. The word of God has touched my heart. I have been thinking about doing this for a while. Now is a good time to make that decision. Come. I have been numb to sin too long. I need a revival in my life. I may be sensitive to sin. And the way it tries to destroy me, I need to be baptized or rebaptized. Come. Sister, God bless you. From my heart, God bless you. Someone else. Just slip out and come. I need to be baptized or rebaptized. My life has been changed by this week of revival. Come, my good brother, come. God bless you. It's about 10 after 8. Come, sister, come. I need to be baptized, rebaptized. The Spirit of God has convicted my heart. This week of messages has changed me. Come. God bless you, sister, come. I need to be baptized or rebaptized. Let God see you willing to do that. Come. Someone else. God bless you, sister. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Just come. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you. Come, sister, come. You know the condition of your life. You cannot fool God. You can fool me. You fool yourself. But as the Spirit touches your heart, respond. Start with God all over through rebaptism. Or make the decision for the first time to be baptized. Make it as the Spirit speaks to your heart. Don't wait for a better time. It may never come. I want to be baptized or rebaptized. I want someone from this church to come and take the names of those who came. Some leader of the church, come quickly. Come and take the names. Someone else? Then I have to pray. Let you go. But before I pray, I believe there's someone else who needs to come. I want to give you that opportunity to come as the Spirit of God touches your heart. You've been thinking about doing it. Here's a chance to make that decision public in heaven and earth. I want to be baptized, rebaptized. This week has changed my life. I've learned so much. I've seen myself for who I really am. And I need to resume my walk with God through rebaptism or baptism. Come. If it's a cultural thing not to come, fight it and come. We have someone come with some paper and pencils. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Heads bowed. Eyes closed. While the heads are bowed, the eyes are closed. I'm about to pray. If God has been touching your heart and you feel you need to make this decision, will you not make it now before I pray? The word of God has touched me this week. I've seen myself more clearly for who I am. I need to resume my walk with God. I'm convicted to be baptized or to be rebaptized. I want you to come and make that decision while heads are bowed and eyes are closed just before I pray. If you're being convicted, then it's God's will. Answer the conviction and come. Someone else. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll give you 60 seconds, then I pray. In that time, come. If you're not sure you want to be rebaptized or baptized, you're not sure which decision to make, still come. The leaders will help you make the right one. 45 seconds. Head still bowed, eyes still closed. You should be praying that hearts will be softened. The call is baptism, rebaptism, start your walk with God all over. Some of us need to do that. 30 seconds. Let's lose that numbness to sin through the power of God's word, particularly as expressed in his law. 15 seconds. Baptism, rebaptism. We're praying. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you to God for your word, its directness, its power, its clarity. We thank you, Father, for the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts as we've listened to your divine word. Dear God in heaven, we do not want to be numb to sin. We do not want to be dumb to what you have provided in your word to make us alive to sin, which is your law. But Father, so many of us are just numb to sin. We're blind to our true condition. We're not bothered by sin. We're not troubled by all the iniquity in the world. We're just not phased by sin. And we think we're on the road to the pure and the holy. Father in heaven, it is only through your righteous, spirit-filled law that we can be convicted of our true condition and feel our need for Jesus Christ, our righteous Savior. Father, some have answered the call. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you would grant them courage, give them strength. The decision is to be baptized or rebaptized, whatever it is, dear God. Confirm them in this decision, I pray. Fill them with your spirit. Give them a determination to stand by this commitment they've made to your glory. And for those who should have come, who are still wrestling and struggling, dear God, I will now pause in this prayer, Father, and call them one more time. Then, Lord, I'll come back and close it. While heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed, is there someone else who needs to come and say, Lord, I'm making a decision because I've been convicted. I want to be baptized or rebaptized. Start all over with God. Anyone will make that decision while I have paused in the prayer. Just slip out and come. God bless you. God bless you. Do everything you can with God's help to ensure your salvation. If we put as much effort into our soul salvation as we put into securing ourselves in this life, none of us would be lost. 
because we know how to secure ourselves in this life. Put the same effort into your eternal salvation. Anyone else before I close the prayer? Father, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for your word again. Let your spirit continue to trouble hearts that are resisting. I know you love us, dear God. You love us whether we're stubborn or we're cooperative. You love us, but you want us to cooperate with you. So please, through your spirit, your persistent spirit, move upon hearts that need to decide. As we leave for home tonight, let your words remain on our hearts, dear God. Give us a true picture of ourselves as we contemplate your righteous holy law. Bring us back tomorrow to hear more of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless those of you who've come. We've gotten all of your names, I believe. Let's now listen to God's servant as he sings for us. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. If I pray, is this someone else who needs to decide to be baptized or rebaptized as a result of this week of revival? Anyone else? Anyone else? Then I pray. I know there's someone else, but I don't know what's keeping you from making that public decision. I wish you would make it, and I know heaven is on my side. Is there someone else who needs to say, Lord, I am deciding tonight to be rebaptized or baptized? Let's stand as we pray. Father in heaven, in 1882, I believe it is, Ellen White wrote, it is twice as hard to reach the hearts of men today as it was 20 years ago, what she was saying their father, that in 1882 or 86, when she wrote the statement, it was twice as hard as it was to reach people in 1862. Then, Father, how hard is it in 2010? Please, God, there are others who need to make this decision. And if this opportunity passes, they may never be convicted again. And so, Lord, at the risk of irritating your people, I pause in the prayer again to make the final call tonight. Is there someone who still needs to make the decision to be baptized or rebaptized as the Spirit of God has convicted your heart? Raise your hand. My brother, God bless you. Come, my brother, come. Don't be afraid. Come. Bring him a card, please. Come. Come. I see a hand. Come, sister. Come. Don't be afraid. Come. Bring a card for God's son. Bring a card for God's daughter who's coming. Please get their names. Anyone else? As the Spirit of God touches your heart, raise your hand. God bless you, sister. Anyone else? And then I close the prayer. Put your telephone number as well on that card so the church can contact you. Heaven is rejoicing. You've done the right thing. Anyone else? Please don't be angry with my persistence. I just felt moved to be persistent. Anyone else? Lord, your spirit has touched my heart. 
I want to be baptized, rebaptized. Father, thank you for those who came. I pray from my heart, dear God, you'll sustain them. Now, as we leave this sacred place, take us safely, Father, because the enemy is always trying to destroy our lives. As we go, Father, let us think of what we have heard. Watch over us tonight as we sleep. May it please you to grant us life tomorrow. And if you do, Father, we'll be careful to commit that life to you. Hear this humble prayer, dear God. One more time, sustain those who made the right decision tonight. Sustain them, their Father. And when you come into your kingdom, save us without losing one. We pray from our hearts. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Please travel safely. God bless you. I love you. Come back tomorrow.